Inside Mayo Clinic is made possible in part by a grant from Park Dental Health Centers, providing excellence in dental health care for over 20 years. Kaler Lodging Hotels, providing accommodations for Mayo Clinic visitors for 75 years. SIT New Beginning Mutual Funds, pure no-load mutual funds managed by Twin Cities-based SIT Investment Associates. Group Health, Inc., celebrating 35 years of serving the health care needs of Minnesotans. Tape Mark, providing contract medical manufacturing services for the health care industry and by Weiss Builders, Inc. Inc., construction services for the medical profession with offices in Rochester and the Twin Cities. Traveling to southeastern Minnesota. Through the fertile Zumbro Valley, past farmland and trout streams. More than 100 miles from any major metropolitan area, this quiet countryside is home to one of the most advanced medical facilities ever built. A clinic in a cornfield, known the world over as simply Mayo. How did this institution come to be here? Why do patients from all over the world travel to the small city of Rochester? The birth of this place was a response to a tragedy over 100 years ago. Tornadoes in this part of the country are not unusual, but this one was worse than most. August 21st, 1883. The tornado came up between four and six o'clock in the evening, although all day long it had been, something had been going in the sky. It was just uh, ominous. When it struck, the tornado cut a swift and deadly path from one end of town to the other. 157 houses had been swept away, 31 dead and hundreds injured. The town turned to the leadership of Dr. William Worrell Mayo to organize the medical care of the victims. Born in 1819 near Manchester, England, Mayo had settled in the Zumbro Valley in 1863 and served as an examining surgeon for Civil War recruits. He established a solo medical practice one year later in Rochester. The intrepid doctor's young sons followed in his footsteps. 22-year-old William was already a fledgling doctor, and Charlie, younger by four years, an aspiring medical student. In the next few days, the trio worked around the clock. All of Rochester became makeshift hospitals. Many of the injured were taken to the Academy of Our Lady of Lourdes, a small convent of Franciscan school teachers, headed by the indomitable mother, Alfred Moes. Months later, when the wounds began to heal, and residents to rebuild, Mother Alfred had a vision. She came to Dr. W. W. Mayo and told him that in a dream she had been called to establish a hospital. Under his direction, it would become world-renowned for its medical arts. Dr. Mayo was skeptical. How could such a place survive in a small country town? Where would the money come from? And besides, Mayo argued, at 64, he was too old to establish such international fame. You have sons, Mother Alfred replied. They will be great surgeons. The world will find a path to your door. Dr. Mayo, if the sisters build a hospital, will you staff it? Five years later, Mother Alfred had raised the money necessary for the building to begin. The doors of St. Mary's Hospital were scheduled to open on October 1st, 1889. But the night before, Charlie Mayo unofficially christened the new facility by performing emergency eye surgery in its new operating room. Mother Alfred was right. The world found a path to their door. Originally built to accommodate 27 patients, 
By 1912, St. Mary's had grown to 300 beds and six operating rooms. As the Sisters of St. Francis cared for every hospital need, from patients to surgery to laundering sheets, the Mayo brothers honed their skills and established their reputation in the surgical arena. Charlie and Will sought out partners to join them in their budding practice. And as a team, they established the first private group practice in the world. Today, the team has grown to more than 1,000 doctors and scientists. St. Mary's and Rochester Methodist Hospitals have close to 2,000 beds and 87 operating suites. And with the facilities of 45 buildings and nearly 20,000 personnel, the physicians at Mayo treat more than 300,000 people each year. But what does all this mean to one person, the patient? I look at Mayo as thousands upon thousands of individual acts of caring towards other people who come to us who are sick that you hardly ever see, but you hear about in the cracks. Ryan Hers is six years old. And for the last two years, he has had diabetes. The ancient Egyptians used to say that it caused its sufferers to melt into the loins. And in late 19th century America, diabetes was known as the wasting disease. Children diagnosed with diabetes could expect to live, at the most, a few months. In 1917, the Mayo Clinic established a 12-room diabetes center and began pioneering studies on the influence of diet on the disease. This work caught the attention of Toronto researchers Banting and McLeod, and in 1922, the center was invited to be one of the first groups to undertake clinical trials of a promising new treatment, insulin. The results of giving insulin to Mayo's first 150 diabetic patients were, according to Mayo's Dr. Russell Wilder, exhilarating. You're Ryan. Yeah. Good morning, Ryan. Hi. You. you haven't had your breakfast yet this morning? No. And how old are you? Um, six. Six so years old. It's hard on here. When you're finished with your first blood test, half that time. Ryan Churs. That's Ryan Churs. Churs. You've been to see us before? Yeah. Did your blood drawn? Yeah. Okay. And you know mostly what's going to happen here. When you get your blood, can I have a sample so we can test our machine with yours? Mm -hmm. A little nervous about this, Mom. That's a little tight. Could you just yep. a little bit this way? That's fine. Squeeze that for me. Oh, right. Take a breath, honey. All done. <laughs> Good job. The very, very special feeling of being around children uh, really infected me when I was uh, working in a uh, children's hospital as a medical student. And it was, it was almost like a, uh, a complete aura. It was as much, uh, it, it was as much this aura of Kids are what's really important. Kids are great. Kids are neat. Uh, just as much as when you go to a place of worship, you get this sense of God is great. Ryan, hers. Ryan, how long have you had diabetes now? Has it been? 40 years. No. Just about two. Just about two. Has it been that long? Yeah. Do you remember like what month and year it was? March, March 19th. Okay, of 80 or 90. 90. Okay. I can remember that date quicker than I can remember his birthday. They stand out, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Patients, especially children, uh, view the medical condition part as being um, the part that they like the least, uh, the part that times they may even want to try to pretend doesn't exist. They have to believe, as it were, that, that I'm interested in something about them different from their diabetes. I'm not just the crumb that says, you 
got to control your diabetes. Let's, you know, I'm, I'm, I really am interested in uh, how they are living their lives. I'm interested in, in trying to help them uh, be the person they want to be or do this activity that they want to do. Hi. 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 Mr. and Mrs. Schurz. I'm Hers. Dr. Schaefer. Hers? Hers. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. And this Hi. must be Ryan. Is it Ryan? Um, I know I haven't seen you before in the mm -hmm. clinic, so let mm -hmm. me just tell you a little bit about what my role is with the diabetes clinic. I'm a <gasps> behavioral psychologist and um, I specialize in behavioral diabetes. So the kinds of things that I do is I work with parents and the children mm -hmm. to answer any questions that you might have related to developmental stages that Ryan might be going through um, and any other kinds of stresses that might be going on in the family, okay? What I'd like to do first, since I haven't met with you before, is to get a sense of what your family is like. Do you have any brothers and sisters, Ryan? Mm, my sister. She's real brat, Rachel. She is, huh? Yes, she is. <laughs> How old is Rachel? Three. She's three. Daddy right. Rachel. Having diabetes sometimes seems to some of the young people like, well, that's really something that, that makes me different. Dr. Schaefer might recommend that a patient uh, consider telling at least a few close friends so that the diabetes not be considered a real barrier to membership in the peer group. And Ryan, do you have a group of friends or a best friend or both? Kind of um, both. Both? Okay. Little both. But mostly you have a best friend that you play with outside yeah, of school. Mostly. Right? mostly. And who's your best friend? Clayton. Clayton Groats. I met him in kindergarten. Does Clayton know about your diabetes? Yeah. He does. What does he think about that? I don't really know. You don't really know? Does he ever like to watch you test your blood? Actually, when um, I had my shot and then when I did blood check, he wanted to stay and watch me. Did he want to watch? Yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of the kids like to watch, watch when you do a blood test. Mm -hmm. A lot of them do. They think that's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. The person that's really special during the time of the visit is the child. Well, hi guys. Hi. How you doing? Good. Nice to see you. Good to see you again. How are you? Good. How the heck are you, man? Good. Let me see what you have on your watch. I also want to convey to that child that this whole thing that's going on in this next 45 minutes is for you. You know, you're it. All right, ooch down this way a little bit. Let me see what you got over here, man. Yeah, right. <coughs> Listen to this. It's totally empty. What do you think? That's you. Yeah, right. Well, I think I see three gorillas in there. <coughs> yeah? Yeah, and uh, they're riding on top of some <laughs> elephants. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, they're right in there. It must be pretty loud. Can't you hear them? No. Yeah, right. It's very important to put in perspective that these little diabetic things that need to be done are chores, like brushing teeth and uh, cleaning the room, but they're not the most important part of the day. So what is important? Uh, what's important to you? Let's see over here. This one has elephants right at gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> and those guys got, you know what, they got back aches. <laughs> Each of these children from my perspective is an individual project, an individual creation that is unfolding and we're having some role in trying to help it thrive and do well in the world as it, as it evolves. And to see that flower and to see that creation just be satisfied, be happy, uh, and feel that things are, are fine, despite the fact that we all know that there's been a problem that has required a lot of work. And to have that not be so important anymore, and to have life be just fine, is the, is the payoff. All right, man. Yeah, be good. 
No, you the other way. Otherwise, you just get in deeper trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Good. I think uh, Kyle is next. He's here. I think you can't just be responsible for treating the disease scientifically and not be responsible for taking care of the illness that goes with it. And, and disease is the, is the injury or the dysfunction or the wound or the growth or whatever it is. And the illness is the reaction to it, the, the disturbance of all your relationships and your expectations and all affect the person and that needs attention too. Dialysis is, I think, probably the only specialty where we have a, a technology that keeps people alive very clearly. You know, without the technology, they wouldn't be here. And so the, the patients have a unique perspective. Good morning. I saw this gentleman out eating the other night. Yeah, he did. <laughs> well, you caught us making a big mess, is what you <laughs> I think the patients realize our limitations, and that's what allows us to interact with them on a more personal level. I mean, they know that we can't do everything, that there are certain limits to what medicine can provide. Is this getting worse? Is it looking better no, it's, to it's you? Get, it's getting better. Good, yeah. good. All right. There's so much involved with the patient on dialysis. We all work together for a common goal, and that's to keep them as well, or to feel as well as possible while on dialysis. They, we don't just want to prolong their lives, but we hopefully want to help out the quality of their life. And there's no way that we could do it ourselves. Her dialysate is a standard sodium at 140, a 1 potassium, a 3 calcium, and she is on EPO, is not on Calcigex. Primary concern is with this patient is a chronic low protein intake. He really is weak, but he tries to cover it. I'm really amazed that she gets along as well as she does. Dialysis was 1.18, which is improved. We may have to take her, even if it's a gray zone call, because she's young, she's highly motivated. I think she'd do well with a transplant. There's only so much time in a day, and there's only so much expertise one person can bring to the care of that patient. So our dialysis nurses come back with new ideas on how to provide the treatment and provide monitoring for us. Uh, the social workers have different ideas. Um, worried me that he was going to be dependent upon these ladies and his family, but he's not. So he's been on the list almost a year. He has approximately half a year to another year. The transplant coordinators know exactly what's going on in the transplant area, how somebody's moving through the list, any problems. There's no way that one physician, or I would say even one group of physicians could keep up with all of these different areas so that the I think the health care team is almost epitomized by the way that the dialysis and transplant patients are cared for good morning. good morning how are you this morning okay did you have a good weekend whenever they start dialysis they understand that part of the decision making of whether to go on hemodialysis here in the center or at home or peritoneal dialysis or get a transplant, there's always the last option not to do anything. And we respect that. And I vividly recall an elderly lady who was not in very good health, who lived in a nursing home, who was unable to really provide much care for herself. And I knew her pretty well, and I asked her, I said, well, you know, what's in it for you? What do, what do you enjoy? And she said, Doc, she said, the thing I like is that once a month, my grandchildren come to visit me. And for that, I'm forever grateful. She says, I know I've got a lot of other problems, and I endure a lot of pain and suffering, and you do all you can, but for that one thing, I'm grateful. Recently, I saw a gentleman who came in with metastatic cancer and basically had felt like he was abandoned by most of his physicians. And I think that the clinic itself and the nurturing uh, nature of many of the physicians here really helped him and his family. And he still has the cancer and he still is suffering, but at least he doesn't feel abandoned. And even though he can't be cured, it, 
I went home and I actually told my husband, now this is why we go into medicine. You, you don't really, you don't cure him, but he's better and you're helping him. And that's why we all go into medicine. Hiring Henry Plummer was the best day's work I ever did for the clinic, said Dr. Will. Not only was Dr. Plummer a gifted medical man with an expertise in thyroid disease, but his methodical mind and engineering interest also drew him into designing systems that are integral parts of the organization today. When the Mayo brothers built their first clinic building in 1914, Plummer worked out each detail with the architects. He envisioned the building's communication system in anatomical terms and pushed skeptical engineers to devise a central nervous system, namely the first telephone intercom system in the country. The transport method for medical records was designed like the body's circulatory system, an elegantly simple solution that moved files through a labyrinth of chutes using the force of gravity and basic pulley engineering. Dr. Plummer's mechanical circulatory system has continued for the past 78 years to serve the clinic well. Starting with file number one from 1907, the clinic is presently on patient file number 4,276,671. At any given time, some 100,000 files are in active use. The files are manually pulled from a central records area, and a barcoding system tracks their progress so they can be easily located and retrieved. Then they are gathered together and sent via the records railroad to another location, where they will be transported on a conveyor belt and drop down gravity chutes to their final destination. A patient's file arrives at its destination as quickly as the patient it is to meet, in as little as five minutes. Efficient? Yes, but accurate. Mayo record staff say they have lost fewer than 400 records since 1907. The whole system is a daily reminder of the curious and clever workings of the mind of Dr. Henry Plummer. There are 3,665 nurses at the Mayo Clinic, and their story begins in 1889 with four Franciscan sisters who staffed St. Mary's Hospital. Trained as school teachers, they were new to medicine. Nonetheless, they quickly transferred their devotion from the classroom to the hospital ward. The first of their many challenges was to furnish the hospital, and despite their meager resources, they soon created home-like rooms to comfort their uneasy guests. The sisters managed every detail of operating the hospital. Typical days began at 3 or 4 a.m. and usually didn't end until midnight. A day's chores could easily include going to market, cooking, cleaning, laundering linens, and hauling water. But the sisters' most meaningful work came from caring for the sick. Edith Graham was St. Mary's first professionally trained nurse and original nurse anesthetist, and it was she who taught basic nursing skills to the sisters. Young Charlie Mayo admired her both professionally and personally, and they were married in April of 1893. While a gifted administrator, Sister Joseph Dempsey also served as Dr. Will's surgical assistant. She mastered surgical skills so completely that when one of the Mayo doctors stopped to lecture during an operation, she quietly would continue the procedure without him. And doctors frequently relied on her small, nimble fingers to reach into tight corners of the body that were inaccessible to their larger hands. It was Sister Joseph who saw the future of nursing in greater formal training and licensing. It was she who suggested founding a nursing school. And although the idea was met with hesitation from the Mayo brothers, the school opened in 1906 with a class of two students and quickly grew. Methodist Hospital joined with a similar program in 1918, and before they closed in 1970, these two schools graduated nearly 8,000 nurses. The Mayo Clinic's nursing staff shared the Mayo brothers' zeal for medical innovation and their concern for the patient. Nearly as famous for her work as the Mayo brothers themselves was Alice McGaw. Miss McGaw, a nurse anesthetist, excelled in the new open drop method of administering ether. 
As a woman, McGaw was barred from joining medical societies, but nonetheless, doctors came great distances to observe her technique. It was said the peerless Alice McGaw could actually talk her patients to sleep. While a lot has changed over the past 100 years, some things haven't. I got them all crying, just about. <laughs> this is a new thumb sucking routine. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Oh, Sue, your fever's up again. It is. Can you feel that? I don't feel really sore. Yeah. Where is she up to? 38 and counting. Lots of e emotional, um, physical adjustments that go on. Uh, well, before birth, during and after, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. She's moving She's, all yeah. over here yeah, for me. I felt that. <laughs> all right, good deal. Yeah, the courage that you witness on, on a day-to-day -day basis is just uh, not to be compared. Right away, they had a neonatologist come and talk to me on what the baby's odds were for survival and the different kind of problems that I would run into um, with a, a real early delivery. And as the weeks go by, they come back to talk to you to update you on where your baby is at. And you've been here for how long now? Um, it'll be five weeks on Thursday. So, and hopefully not more than maybe two or a little over that. Yeah. We'll vote for whatever we can do here. Janet's baby, Haley Jane, was born on January 31st at 34 weeks. She weighed five pounds and three ounces. Both mother and daughter are doing fine. I had uh, lost two, we had two miscarriages and I wanted to know why. So then we went through the fertility clinic and then that's how they found the septate uterus. And then when we got pregnant with this one, then they referred us right over to Dr. Judy Nye. And she's a perinatologist. Perinatologist, yeah. And she's um, like high risk doctor. So she specializes in these. What they will do for a healthy baby um, in spite of their own suffering is, uh, is beyond, you know, what, what most of us think of. For some reason, my um, placenta wouldn't come out. So they had to, after we had the baby, they had to go in and do surgery and remove the placenta. Well, and through a lot. So this is a poor woman who delivered vaginally and then ended up um, not being able to deliver the placenta. We were glad because they told us that they maybe wouldn't be able to save the, the uterus because they said if it had actually grown into the uterus wall, they would have had to have taken the uterus out. But then Dr. Nye, she was real good about it because she said that you know, she went in with them and did an ultrasound and showed them where it was, and she knew that we wanted to have more kids, so she told them to make sure they save the uterus. It's been quite an ordeal. But I'm just thankful the baby's okay. You've got a baby boy, so what more do you want? <laughs> That's why you're okay. As the Mayo brothers' surgical skills developed, so did their need for advanced diagnostic techniques. Dr. Lewis B. Wilson was their answer. In 1905, Dr. Will and Dr. Charlie lured Wilson away from his post with the State Board of Health and the University of Minnesota. But it wasn't the Mayo's bigger salary that most attracted Wilson. Intense, curious, and inventive, Wilson prized the ample opportunities for independent research. Charlie and Will soon presented him with a puzzle which Wilson would prove uniquely qualified to solve. We surgeons don't want to cut away either more or less tissue than we need to. Can't you find a way to quickly analyze specimens while the patient is still on the operating table? Wilson retreated to the solitude of his laboratory, 
The old method of hardening tissues in alcohol took hours, sometimes days. The stains used to define the cellular outlines of these fixed tissues didn't work on fresh specimens. But Wilson had a better idea. On a hunch, he shaved a thin section of tissue, then he opened his lab window and set it out on his sill to freeze in the January cold. Using a method he learned in his dabblings as an amateur botanist, he immersed the sample in methylene blue dye, followed by a saline solution, and then mounted it on the slide in a glucose mixture. He trained his microscope on the specimen, and there, clear as day, were the outlines of each living cell. Within weeks, Wilson perfected this microscopic analysis until he could give surgeons the outcome on biopsies within two to five minutes, eliminating much guesswork in operative treatment and sparing patients unnecessary pain and anxiety. Today, surgical pathologists study cells magnified on electronic screens and quickly relay their judgments via intercom to Mayo surgeons. Yet these sophisticated procedures continue to rely on methylene blue dye and the ideas of an intense, bespectacled researcher pursuing the smallest clues to the complexities of life. It's interesting. Now, this is very interesting. I think this is, now we've got Schumer. So I think in, the, in this piece, this is recurrent sarcoma. I don't see uh, any osteoid. OK, so I think uh, I'll give him a call. I have a message here for Dr. Deschamps. The peribronchial tissue contains some of the fibrosis that we saw earlier. But in addition, there's much more cellular tissue and a lot of nuclear atypia with the bizarre nuclei. So that I think that now you're into neoplasm. Uh, it looks like a sarcomatous. And if I didn't know anything else about the case, I would wonder about MFH. OK, what, what, where was that then? What, which... That was in the peribronchial tissue. You're welcome. We examine uh, virtually all of the specimens we see by fresh frozen section. Uh, it was introduced here at the beginning of the century by the Mayo brothers. And uh, basically, we in surgical pathology are doing the exact same as our predecessors, uh, hopefully a, a little bit better. But uh, we're still using essentially the same technique that was developed here, I think it was 1906 or 1907 by Dr. Louis B. Wilson, who was the first pathologist at the Mayo Clinic. Oh, I've got to concentrate on this. Is Dr. Osterling there? What? We'll have him contact you. Thank you very much. Now, I can, I can tell you about the, the operation. Um, we have about 50 operating rooms on this floor. And uh, as the surgeons, uh, um, remove specimens for examination. Uh, they alert us, and the material is picked up by members of our staff here, brought in, uh, logged in. The I idea is to uh, get a microscopic diagnosis as quickly as possible for the surgeon in order that he can direct his operative treatment uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, Dr. Tasia periductal fibrosis, and a calculus. Mm -hmm. How's that sound? And once we have analyzed the specimen, we have intercom communi communication with all of the operating rooms. Uh, there are microphones in the walls of the operating room, so the surgeon can, s can continue his um, procedure uh, w without having to pick up a phone or, and so on. And uh, he can actually al also call us uh, and ask us questions. Uh, the usual question is, why have we not got the answer for him? No, a surgeon wants to, he wants to know something in particular. So he's brought it in himself, and he's showing exactly what he wants to know. We won't do more. Mm -hmm. I would like to know if there is cancer left here, just in this, This area oh, here, okay? Okay. Right. okay, okay, because we'll this left was positive, so I want to know if there's right cancer in this specimen, okay? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kearney. Um, this bottom piece, you want that first? Yes, sir. Now, Dr. Deshaun's probably gone back to the operating room, but he's, he's shown us precisely 
what he wants to know on the specimen, and that's quite very helpful to us. Uh, today we have approximately 50 cases that we will be examining by frozen section. And at the end of the day, we will have perhaps 200 to 300 frozen sections. The uh, close communication we have with the surgeons is very important because um, This is pathology. Yes, sir. For Mr. When the patient is 27, what kind of is positive? The, are you, are you talking about the specimen that you yourself brought in? Yes. The area that you pointed out uh, to us is positive. Good. Is the other margin positive, the real bronchus margin? No. No? No, that is not positive. You're welcome. And there, there is the lesion. There is the, the lesion. Right there. There's the tumor. Many of the diagnoses that we make here are very significant for the patient. All this procedure and all the diagnosis um, carries behind a lot of emotional input or impact in the patient's life. I think it's important to have them as soon as possible. And, and that is the goal that we strive to, to come to a quick answer. Well, I think that this, this is a tumor here, right here. Right, right at the area that he was interested in. Maybe it was because they were developing their practice far from a major metropolitan area. Or maybe it was just their Midwestern spunk. But the Mayo doctor's resourcefulness, their ability to solve medical problems with the materials at hand, has become legendary. This tradition was started by Dr. Mayo Sr. In 1880, before performing a new and risky procedure to remove an ovarian tumor, Mayo asked the patient's husband, a blacksmith, to forge surgical instruments to his specifications. His sons exhibited the same spirit of self-reliance when they equipped the operating rooms at St. Mary's. Using a design he had seen in a European hospital, Dr. Charlie built a surgical table and commissioned new instruments, including a design that is still used today and is known as the Mayo Scissors. As medical treatment grew more complicated, so did the equipment involved. Making these innovations possible are accomplished craftspeople who use age-old techniques to meet the exacting demands of a new technology. Mayo is probably one of the very few that has its own glass bar. There are only seven in Minnesota and about a thousand around the country. There are all those challenges that come up. Uh, people come in and ask to uh, do a lot of things with glass that uh, you probably couldn't do with other materials, and that's what makes it very interesting for me. Much of the major technological problem solving happens here in the clinic's well-lit basement workshop. When doctors team up with these engineers and craftspeople, the results are precise solutions to individual medical needs. My name is Steve Gers. I'm a research assistant for Dr. Patrick Kelly at the Mayo Clinic in the Department of Neurosurgery. And my job is twofold. One is to assist Dr. Kelly in surgery using a procedure called stereotactic neurosurgery. Most of the patients that we deal with have some sort of brain tumor. And the idea is to find out what kind of tissue that tumor is or to go ahead and, and resect it. And the other half of my, my job is to, to work on instrument development and design new instrumentation to overcome limitations that we have in surgery. Dr. Kelly addresses those problems to me and then I think about how to apply that and then I come down to the Department of Engineering here I talked with Ron Wilcox. He says, I got an idea. I want to come and talk to you. About the best way to approach this problem. And we sit in my office, we flip our own ideas, and we call a machinist. And they have wonderful ideas of how to overcome some of these hurdles. 
when we get real close, we call Steve down to find out, well, is it is this what you're looking for? And he says, yeah, kind of, but uh, can you do this sometimes? And otherwise, he says, it's just perfect. And the group together can produce solutions that I, by myself, would not have done. On the day of surgery, the patient would come come to surgery and they would apply a stereotactic head frame to the patient. And the function of this head frame is to find a target point to locate the tumor and generate a volume of that tumor so he knows how it's located and oriented in three-dimensional space. Normal brain down here, okay? All of this is abnormal. Now, uh, Rick, let's go down to say minus seven now. These stereotactic ones are most challenging and most fulfilling when you get done. It's rewarding when you find out a part works and they use it and they, you know, help someone to save their life or whatever. You know, it's very fulfilling. This can locate a, a surgical target within a millimeter, less than a millimeter. With this machine, the surgeon can confidently remove tumors that. Before we started this process, they would not even touch. And we've worked on patients as young as a year to 18 months old. I remember describing cases to physicians and say, well, I would never do that case. And we've already done it. How can you become any more, any closer to a person than to, you know, physically, you know, cut into them? And I think with that intimacy becomes a bond that, that you, that's, it's hard to get in other fields. You know, with that privilege, there comes an obligation to really pay attention. And I always felt that I, I would never want to operate on a stranger. You know, that you'd get to know the person before you wound them. When William Worrell Mayo practiced medicine in the mid-1800s, surgery was in its infancy and was usually performed in a patient's kitchen with the family standing nearby. Doctors washed their hands after the surgery rather than before. Tinkering with the inner workings of the human body was a last resort. Medicine was a combination of luck and determination. W. W. Mayo's sons, Will and Charlie, came of age as doctors by their father's side. When St. Mary's Hospital was built in 1889, the doctors Mayo were able to move their practice to a safer and more controlled setting and perform surgical procedures that were once unheard of in numbers that far exceeded their contemporaries. Far from any major medical center, surgery at this little clinic in the cornfields had become an acceptable and deliberate means of restoring health. Still, the doctors were determined to learn more, and at any opportunity, they traveled the world over to watch renowned surgeons in action. Always they returned home, bringing new ideas back to their practice. They were determined that their patients would have access to the best new medical knowledge available. After each trip, the chief surgical nurse, Sister Joseph, used to warn her staff, Dr. Will is back. Now there will be lots of things to change. And she was right. Soon the Mayo's own doorstep was crowded with surgeons eager to learn from the young Westerners. And today, using modern technologies and sophisticated procedures, Physicians continue to follow the same path as the young Mayo brothers, constantly seeking better ways to make their patients well. My specialty is diagnostic radiology, and uh, within diagnostic radiology, there are many imaging techniques that we use. And it is a remarkable process day to day to take an expedition into the body, in essence, and see what is going on or what is not going on. Everyone's liver looks uh, a little different, uh, and everyone's tumor is a little bit different. Uh, so just as different as we are on the outside, we are equally different on the inside. On the back of the head, now we're coming forward, cutting through the head. There's our cerebellum. 
The answers uh, come up in terms of images, but the images require interpretation, and there are many ways to interpret this stuff. This is very much an art as well as a science. There was an unfortunate patient in Scottsdale, Arizona, who had a walnut-sized tumor in his liver. He was not a candidate for surgery because of a poor uh, health having to do with his heart. So the only alternative for him for this cancer was a unique treatment of the injection of alcohol with a needle directly into the mass. In the United States, there were actually very few places where anyone had experience with that technique. But I knew Dr. Bill Charbonneau in Rochester had done a few patients. And we felt quite comfortable that we could guide them through this procedure using the live satellite system. The satellite telecommunication system has been described as the glue that holds the Mayo Clinic together in these geographically remote settings of Scottsdale, Arizona, and uh, Jacksonville, Florida. That view is pretty straightforward. Lots of room to watch the needle come down. So Dr. Collins was uh, scanning the patient in Scottsdale, Arizona live and watching the images on his monitor a few feet from the patient. Along the edge of the view from here. Yeah. But I would probably have... Under ultrasound guidance, I watched uh, the needle go into the tumor. Those same images were transmitted via the satellite to, uh, to Rochester, Minnesota. That's the tip. Beautiful. Right there. Stop. Now breathe. Now let him breathe. Joe, you're doing great. Now remember, the distance is 44,000 miles, 20, 22,000 up and 22,000 down. Now the next time, have him take in a breath and give it a good, good another blast in the same way you did and it'll be a great ice ball. Another breath in, Mr. Dunning. And it reminded me of uh, when I was in residency and Bill Charbonneau was training me how to do liver biopsies. Uh, he'd stand right behind me and coach me all the way through it. Uh, it seemed just like that. Now you'll see the tip there is that specular thing. I'd push it forward just a snitch and give it another little blast. I think that distance going half a foot or a foot into the body and seeing what's going on with tremendous detail with with x-ray with magnetism with ultrasound is a remarkable feat but then to simply take that information and to then transmer transmit that data on a satellite to a remote location is another feat uh, that's equally uh, amazing to me okay i think you've done it any other so we'll see you back the same time same channel good job Bye -bye. i did great thank you another deep breath mr and my dad was a neurosurgeon, and he was seeing a lady, I think, from Dodge Center out here, about 20 miles. Away. And she had uh, a meningioma. It's a, it's a big tumor, and it calcifies. So it could be seen even in those days you know, on x-ray. And he saw this lady, and he was a very nice, he was a, had been a farm boy from Iowa, you know, and he, he, came, he founded the section on neurosurgery, and he was a very gentle man. And he explained to her all the things that, you know, it had a dialogue and he listened and understood. And uh, they made the arrangement to be operated the next day or the day after. And Dr. Will Mayo called him and said, well, you know, Mrs. Thompson doesn't, doesn't want you to operate on her. I said, well, why, why is that? And he said, well, you, you didn't examine her. My dad said, examine her head? You know, she had a calcified man. And he said, yes, examine her head. So he realized that the patient needed that expression of concern, acknowledgement, attention, presence that was involved in a, a contact. So he said all the rest of his life he, he examined heads and he, he found some interesting things. And then I, I listened to him and so when I became a sir, I think seldom in my lifetime did I ever see a patient and leave the room without examining them. One, you found out a lot and two, it was a it's a link, you know, it's a sort of a way to appreciate this problem together. My mom, who lives in South Florida, um, had a stroke years ago and had started, she would come up to visit me for, for a few weeks at a time and then not seeing her time after time, I noticed a major difference in her health as she was walking and, and such. 
I called her physician down there and he called me back once and I mentioned this to him and he was very brief with me, very abrupt. Then he wouldn't ever call back. And I was very frustrated and I um, basically insisted that my mom come up here to go to the Mayo Clinic because I'd heard great things. What we said as family members or as an observer mattered. They were interested in every single clue. They work like detectives to put things together and they wanted the, as a matter of fact, it became part of the exam. Uh, did you notice anything? What have you noticed in the past couple of weeks? So the family, it, it's, it's almost a holistic approach. What's happened uh, since last we saw you? I had, had some she had two stuff. blackouts. Oh, she had two blackouts at the racetrack. At the racetrack. At the racetrack. <laughs> she uh, blacked out um, after eating. I took my place at the steps. Mm -hmm. And I, I was black there. I don't remember it. You don't remember? I heard that they were both, that they were both at the racetrack. Okay. Both times? Jean told me it was at the racetrack. Both times? Yeah, I don't know. You told me. But it is what you just it's said. It's not now. that I'm living at the racetrack. I go every week or every second week or third week. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> what, um, you don't remember anything about well, it. What she's saying about this is exactly the same as when she blacked out along with me. It's the same, the same thing when she gets up, everything's fine as if nothing happened, as if she's just gone to sleep right after eating. Um, Isn't that strange? Just after eating, each time. Touch my finger. Close your eyes. Touch your nose. Come back and touch my finger. Do it again. Keep your eyes closed. I want you to touch your nose and come back and touch my finger with your eyes oh, closed, oh, okay? Hopefully, mm -hmm. okay. Touch your nose and come back and touch my finger. Dr. Graf Radford will be seeing you later today. He's the neurologist, neurologist. that saw you before. Yeah, sure. I haven't seen him for like two years, I think, right? Yeah. I want you to see him again because what? this syncopal episode, what we call syncope, where you were unconscious for those 10 minutes while you were sitting at the racetrack. I wasn't unconscious. I fell asleep there. Fell asleep? Yeah. I, didn't, I, I wasn't unconscious. Uh -huh. Usually, um, if people can't wake you up, it's more than just being asleep. But I got up by myself. Because you only you can wake yourself out of it. Nobody can wake you up out of it. Just a, I can't tell you t too much because I was not there. <laughs> right. Well, this unconscious episode may be just uh, something that we can't do much about. But on the other hand, we'd certainly hate to miss something like perhaps you had some sort of a seizure that caused the unconsciousness. Look at me. Mm -hmm. How many fingers is that? Two. All together. Now look at me. All right. Look at me. Yeah. Oh, one or two is three. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's cover the other eye. Look at me. Two. That's right. Give us one of your smiles, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's excellent. All right. That's good. Now, don't open your eyes, no. but, but touch this finger to your nose. Let's do that one more time. All right. Okay. I had a little test like that with Dr. Frank. How oh. do you feel when you stand up? You feel okay? Yes. Feel steady? I'm all right. Good. I feel all right. What should I feel? You I should feel all right. <laughs> <laughs> Just check. <laughs> okay, why don't you sit down? What is the date today? Do you know? Uh, no, not really. How about well, we the... We didn't read the paper. Is that is it third? How about the year? The year? What? After the fifth, I know. It's after the fifth. After the fifth of which month? Oh, are you okay? February. Of course. You can ask easy questions. <laughs> huh? And what floor are you on? Uh, is it on the eighth floor? That's exactly right. That's a new place now. Right. Both doctors, they were very, very interested in me. Every little thing, every little thing. How many doctors are like that? Hmm? How many? Not too many? I think you agree that there's nothing 
Um, sure. Nothing too terrible that we didn't know about before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, that's where we are. I feel that the Mayo Clinic is giving back my mother's life. She was really, it was very scary there for a while. We thought mom was real close to the end. And, and it's not just that mom's health has come back, but her personality is there too. It's not as if you have just a person whose heart is beating. Yeah. So you see, I think they know what they're doing here. You know, what's, what's worse than being sick? So that's the time when you need a relationship. That's, that's not casual, and it, it, it really links two people together. No urgency to get from the low pressure onto the spine. Yeah, but she still continues to have chest pain. Telling that this is, they injected the dye into his arm. It comes through the kidneys, and when they uh, take the extra. Mm -hmm. Inside Mayo Clinic is made possible in part by a grant from Park Dental Health Centers, providing excellence in dental health care for over 20 years. Kaler Lodging Hotels, providing accommodations for Mayo Clinic visitors for 75 years. SIT New Beginning Mutual Funds, pure no-load mutual funds managed by Twin Cities-based SIT Investment Associates. Group Health, Inc., celebrating 35 years of serving the health care needs of Minnesotans. Tape Mark, providing contract medical manufacturing services for the health care industry and by Weiss Builders, Inc. Inc. Construction services for the medical profession with offices in Rochester and the Twin Cities.